Lately, the streets of Tehran are on the news a lot. And if you're a car enthusiast, you probably recognize these cars, right? Peugeot 405, maybe a Peugeot 206. They look like they stepped out of a 90s documentary or maybe like Europe shipped its leftover to Iran. But let me tell you a little secret. You are looking at the Iranian illusion. These aren't exactly the same cars. In fact, the vast majority of them are completely Iranian made. Yes, you heard it, right? While we are used to hearing about Iran's nuclear armed war machine, behind the scenes there is a massive automotive industry operating there. An industry born out of necessity, first to develop under sanctions and producing, or maybe I should say, produced over a million vehicles a year. In this video, we will dive deep, expose the most common models and understand their connection to their western ancestors. To understand how Iran's modern automotive industry was created, we need to go back in time, even farther than you might think. Like many developing countries, Iran's automotive industry began with assembly of foreign models. In the 1960s and 70s, western car manufacturers like Chrysler through the Hillman Hunter model assembled in Iran as the Paikan, and later Peugeot and Citroën established production and assembly lines in Iran under Iranian companies. Iran National and Saipa. The Paikan became a real icon, a simple and reliable car that starred on Iranian roads for decades, with production continuing well into the early 2000s. You could say it was Iran's Beetle. But then came the Islamic Revolution of 1979. The revolution changed Iran from end to end, including its relationship with the Western world. Economic sanctions were imposed on Iran, making it very difficult to import components, knowledge and new technologies. Western car manufacturers were mostly forced to downsize or exit the Iranian market entirely. Suddenly, Iran found itself facing an enormous challenge. How to continue supplying vehicles to a growing population when access to foreign technology was so limited? The answer was simple but complex to implement. Produce them themselves. The policy was to develop local production capabilities, rely on existing technologies and try to replicate or improve them independently. This was a key moment when Iran's two automotive giants, Iran National that turned to Iran Khodro, or ECO in short, and Saipa became the backbone of Iran's automotive industry, and they are responsible for most of the cars you will see on the roads there today. Iran's automotive industry isn't just a source of transportation but also employs millions of people and is Iran's second largest source of income after oil and gas. So let's get back to the cars we saw in the intro. Those that look so familiar but actually aren't. We start with the Peugeot 405 which was a very popular family car in Europe in the late 80s and early 90s. It won the European Car of the Year award in 1988 and was considered modern, comfortable and reliable. In Iran, it became a huge hit. Iran Khodro purchased the 405 production license and when sanctions began to take effect, they simply continued producing it, but in their own way. Today, the 405 is barely found in the West, but in Iran, it continues to live under different names. Eco Pars. For example, this is essentially the slightly updated version of the 405. If you look closely, you'll notice minimal cosmetic changes, slightly different front and rear lights, updated grille, and sometimes minor interior changes. Externally, it's still very similar to the original, but what happens under the hood? Here's where the substantial difference begins. While the original 405 used various Peugeot engines, the Eco Pars is usually equipped with Iranian engines or local versions of old Peugeot engines. One of the common engines is Peugeot XU7, but in a locally manufactured version in Iran. It's a 1.8 liter engine producing around 100 horsepower. It's an old, reliable engine, but far from being economical or powerful by modern standards. 
Recently, ECO has also begun incorporating the EF7 engine developed in Iranian-German cooperation. This is a 1.7 liter engine with about 130 horsepower and relatively more economical and it's considered the peak of their local development in this field. In most cases, the ECO parts come with a 5-speed manual transmission, automatic transmission are rarer and even when available, they are usually older technology, sometimes based on Chinese technology or local assembled versions of old Peugeot transmissions. The basic platform stays the same, so driving experience is quite similar to the original 405. Brake systems are usually less advanced and you'll often find front disc brakes and rear drum brakes. Let's move on to the Eco Cement. If the parse is just the 405 with slight changes, the Cement is Iran Hodro attempt to create a real national car. It's still based on the 405 chassis, but with a completely new body in Iranian design. The goal was to present a car with a more modern appearance that would symbolize Iran's independent production capability. The cement offers similar interior space to the 405, but with a larger trunk like the Iranian people love. Here too you will find the older XU7 engine as well as Eco's more advanced EF7 engine which is a preferred engine in the more expensive versions. The cement usually offers a slightly higher level of equipment than the parts but still basic by western standards. Safety system like ABS and ESP as well as comfort feature like cruise control are manufactured locally by Iranian companies. Though Korean companies like Mobis and Mondo also sell such equipment to Iran. In addition to this, there is also the Eco Arisan, which is essentially a small pickup based on the 405 chassis. This pickup uses the very outdated rear wheel drive chassis from the Paikan and body parts from the Peugeot 405. A strange combination, but it's indicative of the engineering's constraint. We continue with the Peugeot 206, which was a very popular super mini in Europe. Eco here too began producing it in Iran, but the Iranians weren't satisfied with the familiar hatchback version and created the Eco 206 SD which stands for sedan. This is one of the most interesting models, while Peugeot produced a sedan version of the 206 mainly for developing markets, in Iran it became a huge hit. Why? Because Iranians love a big trunk. Adding a separate trunk turned the compact 206 into a kind of practical mini family car, and sure an ugly one. Iranians 206 models use Peugeot TU3 and TU5 engines. These are familiar and reliable engines, but they too are mostly manufactured locally in Iran. We also have here mainly 5-speed manual transmission. Automatic versions exist, but they are rare and more expensive. Usually older 4-speed automatic transmission that what we'll get. The Eco Runa is another development from the 206 platform. The Runa is essentially a more updated version of the 206 SD with more modern interior and exterior design in an attempt to distance it from the original French appearance. The Runa is manufactured with Peugeot TU5 engines in an updated version. The interior quality can be slightly better with basic digital displays but still far from western standards. Let's move to Saipa. Iran's second largest car company. Their story is somewhat different, but still reflects the same reality. Saipa initially produced old Citroën models like the Diane and Mehari, and after the revolution, for many years, Saipa produced the Kia Pride in Iran. The Kia Pride is based on the Mazda 121, or Ford Festiva if you will. In Iran it became a popular car, especially in sedan versions. It was cheap, reliable, and easy to maintain. The newer models, the Saipa Tiba and Quick, were already created with platforms and engines in local development that relied on old technologies from western manufacturers. In summary, what we see here is a clear pattern. Take a proven platform, use existing knowledge and modify it as needed to meet local needs while dealing with technological and import limitations. Despite Iran leadership living in the Stone Age, especially now, regarding the automotive field there have been continuous attempts to develop newer models with more modern design and more advanced technology as much as economic sanctions allow them. In fact, automotive production parts are the top smuggled items into Iran, valued at billions of dollars annually, from electronics to tires which are in shortage in Iran. 
Among the more modern models you can find the Eco Tara, which is based on the Peugeot 201 platform, but with substantial changes. It offers a more modern appearance, improved equipment including touchscreens and basic safety systems and relatively higher safety levels. And also Sepa Shaheen, which was designed to replace the Tiba as a Sepa's flagship model. It too offers more modern design, but underneath it's based on an old Toyota Yaris platform in Chinese cooperation. This indicates Iran's attempt to diversify its technological sources. So we have understood that Iranian cars might look like cousins of European models, but underneath they are a completely different story. The big question is why? What led to the technological gaps and especially the gaps in safety and technology? The answer lies in the economic sanctions that Iran had over the past four decades. However, after the agreement with the Obama administration, there was a momentary return of major companies like Peugeot, Volkswagen, Renault and others into the Iranian market that was saturated with cheap labor and empty factories. In 2018, sanctions returned and those same major companies left with their tails between their legs after paying compensation to the business people that they had signed contracts with. It's actually quite interesting when you think about it. Sanctions and embargoes led to the development of a complete automotive manufacturing industry in a country ruled by religious extremists. This raises question about Israel's ability to create a thriving automotive manufacturing industry for the Middle East in general, if only we wanted to or perhaps were forced to, similar to Iran. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and write in the comments which details surprise you the most. I'd love to read them and I'll see you on the next time.